And I'm going to jump in with our first teaching text here this morning. It comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. I'll be reading from the NLT version. Uh, that's the version that will also be on the screen. Uh, but you can follow along in whatever version you prefer. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. And our next teaching text comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and this is verses 12 through 15. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest. Do you want me to make adjustments here? that better? I could shave my beard quickly. <laughs> you have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember, that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Let me pray. Father, we ask that you would show up here this morning by your spirit. I believe that you've inspired these words to be written, these words that um, seem so ancient and in many ways foreign to us. We just pray that you would give us the imagination this morning uh, and the humility uh, to, to submit ourselves to your word and to allow you to reshape the way we see the world, uh, the way we behave in it for your glory, and we trust it's also for our good, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you know that it's possible to buttress your resistance of God's grace with good theology? How many of you know that you can stiff arm God's grace by theologizing? Even uh, this week, some of you um, will be familiar with the C.S. Lewis's book, The Last Battle. I was reading that to my kids this week. And there's a scene where you might remember the very clever um, ape known as Shift comes up with a plan to dupe his not so bright donkey friend named Puzzle into wearing a lion's skin so that the other animals in the kingdom mistake Puzzle the donkey for the true king, a lion known as Aslan. And of course, Puzzle the donkey isn't uh, the brightest of the animals, but he's sensible enough to intuit that there's something wrong with this picture and he protests to Puzzle or sorry, he protests to shift, and it only takes a couple of moments of shift's clever theologizing. He says, oh, puzzle, let me do the thinking. Just imagine all the good you could do in the name of Aslan. And so it only takes a moment for shift to convince puzzle to go along with the plan and to dress up as a lion. And I think sometimes we Christians can be both the clever ape and the dull donkey at the same time. It's easy for us to deceive ourselves sometimes with our own theologizing. And in my case, I did this when it came to the Sabbath, uh, up until uh, fairly recently, don't judge. Several years ago, I uh, planned a, a teaching series at Central Presbyterian Church, our main mother church up in Towson. Uh, on what we call the spiritual disciplines, which is just kind of an old word for uh, the habits that Christians have used, followers of Jesus have used over uh, the centuries for, for, for becoming like Jesus and behaving like Jesus. And I included Sabbath as one of the weeks because, you know, I knew some people liked it. 
I knew there were, it was listed in the books that talked about spiritual disciplines. And I was like, all right, some people like it, but I really wasn't that convinced because my instinct, or did I say ego, told me that although some people enjoyed breaks, breaks and resting were limits and limits were crutches. Because when it was, came to hiking, I didn't want to take breaks. Breaks meant that you were out of shape. And when it came to playing sports, I didn't want to be pulled off the field to rest on the bench because that meant that you were not performing adequately. And so I thought, okay, I realize some people like this, but really, there are so many reasons that Sabbath doesn't obtain, at least not to me. Because after all, it's the only one of the Ten Commandments that doesn't get reiterated in the New Covenant. It is expressly fulfilled, therefore completed in Jesus. Sabbath is talking about our eschatological hope when Jesus encounters people and argues over the Sabbath in the New Testament and the Gospels. It's almost always because he's breaking Sabbath rather than keeping Sabbath. Paul explicitly says, don't let anybody judge you by what you do on Sabbath days. I had all the arguments, but these were just so many ways of giving the Heisman to the gift of Sabbath. And then a woman named Melissa Armstrong marched a Trojan horse behind my theological defenses. Melissa was in a small group that I was leading, and she was a top-shelf neurologist at Maryland, and she would not shut up about the Sabbath. She just kept going on and on about it, and she would tell me that not only had her intentional practice of keeping Sabbath improved her doctoring and improved her marriage and given her the latitude to be a better parent, but it had also increased her productivity for this driven, ambitious, successful woman in a very demanding job. She said this had increased her productivity, note, Sabbath is not about productivity, but sometimes God uses our idols to get our attention. More productivity sounded better to me, and so I began to listen. And that sent me on a journey, uh, several years of um, relaxing the theological stiff arm into a posture of receiving this gift of Sabbath. Sabbath. And to be fair, it's it's still very new. I think Jill and I would say that in our current form, we've only been deliberately trying to kind of Sabbath in this way for about a year. And as often as not, at the end of the week, we're like, golly, we didn't really receive the gift this week. We'll give it another shot next week. Uh, So I say that in hopes that it'll help you, that, um, that somewhere between the amateurism that I'm bringing this morning and the wisdom of some people who have practiced and mined the gift of Sabbath for decades that I'll share with you. Somewhere between those two poles, you will hear God's voice beckoning you in to receive this wonderful, wonderful gift. Before we get into it, let me um, take a step back and frame up uh, this little series we're in for you. I'm really grateful to uh, Larry Lynn, pastor at the Village Church in Hamden, for uh, preaching for us last week. He began uh, this mini-series we have for three weeks here called Practicing the Way of Jesus. Practicing the Way of Jesus. We're really looking at these kind of ancient habits or ancient disciplines or practices that the Bible gives us and that our mothers and fathers in Christ for thousands of years have handed down ways that help us to become more like Jesus. When I say become more like Jesus, of course, that's shorthand. I don't mean just that we adopt a set of rules and we follow those rules and therefore our behavior starts to look more like his behavior. That's not what we're talking about here. That's legalism, that can be legislated. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about practices, habits, that shape our desires, that give us both the appetite and the exercises to want to be more like Jesus and to become more like him, if that makes sense. Historically, uh, those habits or those practices have been lumped into two buckets, uh, those of engagement, things like service, things like worship, and those of disengagement, right? Things like silence, Sabbath, solitude, Fasting. 
And we're just in a very brief three weeks series here, so I had to do some prioritizing. And this is the way I went about that. When I think of what is most pressing, most germane for us in 2019 on the corner of 31st and Barclay, I think that Baltimore is an ideologically driven city. Here's what I mean. I mean that many of you who have moved here, many of us who have moved here, have moved here not because Baltimore is a place you come to for the highest salaries or to become famous or to yank on the longest levers of power, but it is a city that has a welter of nonprofits. It's a city that has some top shelf research institutions. It's a city that has uh, been home to some of the foremost civil rights movement leaders. It is a city that has uh, some top shelf hospitals. Uh, and so I think many of the people who move to Baltimore or who are native to Baltimore and thus grow up in this air are people who are ideologically driven. More than a salary, you're looking for a job that has meaning. This is where that comes into play. For people whose jobs have to be meaningful, often you do not need so much to be prodded to engage, but encouraged to disengage. What I mean is it didn't seem like the best use of three weeks to tell you guys, plug in, start serving, join an initiative, because I think many, I know, Many, many of you already are. I'll sharpen that. I know many, many more of you are doing that than are receiving the gift of disengaging on Sabbath or the gift of solitude. All right, makes sense? So that's why uh, we've selected these three that we're talking about um, these weeks. I want to frame up our morning this morning uh, just with three very simple questions about the Sabbath. The first is Sabbath, what does it mean? Second is Sabbath, um, why, uh, why do we need it? Uh, which I'm realizing even this morning is a really utilitarian way of thinking about it. A better title for that section might be why is it a gift? And the third is what might it look like for us? So Sabbath, uh, what, does it, what does it mean? The Bible helps us to encounter the Sabbath before it ever actually uses the word Sabbath. Some of you will remember all the way back to the creation poem in Genesis chapter uh, 1 and 2. Remember, God, uh, the great creative, sets about making the world, and uh, there's this rhythm to it, right? He, he, uh, uh, he creates all of this wonderful stuff, and then it takes a moment to survey it and say that it's good, and each day is segmented from the next one by this refrain, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day, or there was evening, there was morning the fifth day. And what you notice if you read through that is that the amount of detail given to each successive day of creation increases as you go along until it sort of climaxes in day six when God creates humans, women and men in his image. And God sees uh, that it's good. If the Hebrew authors of the Old Testament had had a neon sharpie to talk about the seventh day, I think they would have used it, but they didn't have that, so they, they kind of underscore the seventh day in ways that we often miss. I think they make a fanfare about it. So the other six days, you get increasing detail, increasing text space devoted to talking about the day, but each one of those days is only mentioned once. You get to day seven, and it says the seventh day three times in two verses, beginning chapter two. Seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested and made it holy. I mean, that is pretty incredible if you think about it. Uh, Jewish author says this is so fascinating among the world religions. We often see the gods, the deities of other world religions sanctifying some sort of space, a temple, 
uh, uh, a capital city, the throne of a king, but the God of the Bible, before he makes a sacred space, makes a sacred day, carves out time for himself. It also means that those first humans, their their first day on the job, as it were, was a day in which they wake up, and instead of God saying, all right, get after it, the first day on the job is a day of resting and receiving. Think about that. How profound is that? Made me think about what it would be like as an employer on the first day of hiring someone new instead of putting them into a litany of learning under someone else or having them hit the ground running? What if the first day on the job was a day of resting and receiving so that they learn what the culture of that environment's gonna be? Fast forward on a few chapters in the Bible and we get to Exodus chapter 16. God has just rescued his people out of enslavement in Egypt. You'll remember uh, the, the Israelite people, the Hebrews, were, um, were, were enslaved in Egypt. They were slaves there. God rescues them across the Reed Sea. He leads them into the wilderness for freedom and for a relationship with him. And then they're hungry, right? And so God, in Exodus chapter 16, provides miraculously for them uh, quail to eat and this bread that comes down sort of with the dew each night and is there for them to gather in the morning. And this is what he says. He says, there's going to be manna there for you. That's what they called it, manna, for you every day for six days. Uh, So collect it each day for six days. On the sixth day, you've got to collect twice as much because there's not going to be any manna on the seventh. And I thought this is fascinating. You know, for, for we moderns, imagining God providing wafers, on the ground every morning is just a little, it's hard to imagine, right? But the way the people respond to this is so easy to imagine. Because you get the group of people who, I mean, they're sort of like the get rich quickers. They want to go out every day and just stockpile, hoard this manna, and they start like storing it up, and immediately, if they try to keep it on days one through five, if they try to keep this manna overnight, it gets wormy and sour overnight. God's like, "Uh uh-uh, can't do that. But the manna that they collect on the sixth day keeps overnight just fine. And then you've got the other group of people who aren't that into working a little extra, and maybe don't trust that God will provide for them on the seventh day, so they don't store up. They go out on the seventh day looking for the manna there to gather up, and there is none. God says, this is a Sabbath day. And that's where we first get the word Sabbath. Interestingly to me, in the very beginning of that chapter, Exodus 16, verse 4, I think, God says, and in this way, in the midst of this provision, I will test my people. Not a test like, are they smart enough to get this? It's not an intellectual test that you get graded on. It's a test of trust, right? Will my people trust me? that my way is a good way and that I'll provide for them and be gracious to them? Will they lean the weight of their lives on me in a pattern of provision over seven days that involves six days of work and one day of rest? That's where we first see the word Sabbath there in Exodus chapter 16. Of course, just a few chapters later, Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai. God meets him. God gives him the, uh, the covenant, the law, and this idea of Sabbath, a day of ceasing, a day of resting, a day of stopping from work is enshrined in the Ten Commandments as the fourth commandment. And so that's where we got our reading from Exodus chapter 20 this morning. By the time you get to the New Testament, uh, of course, the Sabbath has become one of the three signal markers of the Jewish people, and of Christians for that matter, and it's one of only two that you can ascertain without taking your clothes off. This is one of the things that marks God's people out as his. 
Some of you even today have uh, been around Jewish communities in Pikesville or Brooklyn or uh, Israel or otherwise, and you've noticed how for observant Orthodox Jewish people, this really, their celebration of Sabbath really marks them off as culturally distinct, right? Whether it's elevators that on the Sabbath stop at each floor so that nobody has to press a button, or whether it's coffee makers that don't run on Saturdays because uh, that would be work, or uh, even this last two weeks ago, I was showing some tourists uh, what's called an aruv. It's a metal wire that goes in a big circumference around a village, and it shows the Orthodox Jewish people how far they can walk on a Sabbath day so as not to overwork. This was something that marked out the people of God as culturally different. And for the earliest Christians, no less, this keeping of Sabbath was something that showed to a listening world or a watching world, as much as just about anything else they did, that they trusted in a good and gracious God more than they trusted in the Roman denarius. And that's maybe a good transition point to start talking about why we need the Sabbath. Or, as I said earlier, maybe a better title would be, why is it such a gift? Late 18th century France, uh, so in your history, remember this is the time uh, when you've got revolutions sparking all over the world, the American War of Independence, the French Revolution. Uh, you've got the Industrial Revolution is, is starting to tick up. You've got the founding of the modern missions movement, but in terms of spiritual temperature, we're at a low ebb between the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening on both sides of the Atlantic. 1793, France, in an effort to increase their productivity and to distance themselves from Christianity, de-Christianizes their calendar and goes from a seven-day work week, because that seems arbitrary, to a 10-day work week in an effort to ramp up productivity. And the only thing that went up was suicide rates and burnout, and productivity plummeted. Productivity plummeted. I think um, this suggests to us something about the way God has set up the world. A.J. Swoboda tells us that uh, even NASA, when they were first doing some of the first NASA uh, stay in space missions, the astronauts were supposed to work these like 100 day uh, shifts without a break and they ended up saying, like, they went, on, the astronauts in space went on strike because after uh, however many dozens of days they were like, this doesn't work. This goes against, the, against our biology. A.J. Swoboda um, says this, as God invites us to Sabbath, we will be tempted to think that Sabbath cannot work for us. I don't have time to take a whole day to rest. People have expressed that to me for years. Biblically, however, this is not the case. The biblical story tells us that to rest one day a week is to be truly human, and to not rest is to be inhuman. I realize that's deeply offensive language, but maybe you'll allow that to irritate you enough to get under your skin and seep into your imagination. Humans were made to rest. When we say we don't have time to rest, we cannot find time for something that has already been found. For me, this was one of the, my biggest problems with Sabbath. It seemed like it was a limit. Like, who needs rest? You don't, just keep going. And I think the first way that Sabbath is such a gift to us is that it is fundamental to our image bearing. I read to you at the outset our teaching text. One was the first listing of the Ten Commandments where it talks about the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20. The other was the second listing of the Ten Commandments where it lists, uh, it lists them in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And in each case, it gives a different rationale. It's the same instructions, keep the Sabbath, keep a day holy, don't work, but a different rationale for why. I don't know if you caught it. A different reason for why, and I think they're both 
important here, and they show us why it's such a gift. Deuteronomy chapter 5 tells us, stop working, keep the Sabbath, because that's what God did. It's not, I don't think, that God got exhausted. I don't think he got tired or tuckered out and needed a break. I think what the Bible tells us, God is perfect and he's perfectly good and he has given us the pattern. He creates, he works, he labors for six days and he enjoys rest. And so firstly, this is a gift not to us in a utilitarian sense of rest, but it's a gift to us because this is the goodness that is, na- nature, this is, that is native to the character of God. God makes men and women in his image, and so one of the first things he does for us is to invite us into this very practice that he has that is part of what it is to be God and therefore to be like God for us. I've been thinking a lot over recent months about what are the gifts that a church like St. Mo's can give to our culture. That's one of the reasons we were talking about uh, friendship over that previous series. And uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, as, as the church in our nation has kind of lost cultural edge and cultural credibility, we've tried to find ways to make ourselves appealing to the culture in order to kind of stay on the front burner, as it were. And often what that looks like is making the Sunday morning worship experience better better sound, better preachers, better musicians, better kids ministry, better signage, smoke lights, and I'm all for excellence on Sunday mornings. But what if one of the greatest gifts we could give our city in 2018 or 2019 is actually a better quality of life? Not only a better Sunday morning experience, but a better quality of life because we, God's people, out of trust for him, start to live the way that he lives, the way he's invited us into, and we find that we are living in line, in grain with the way that he has set up the universe, and we're no longer getting splinters, so the saying goes, from going against the grain of the universe. Rodney Stark, the sociologist and historian, says that this the better quality of life that Christians experienced across socioeconomic strata, no matter what your circumstances were, the better quality of life that Christians had as a, way of, as a result of living in the way of Jesus was the primary reason that the church exploded in the first four centuries and ended up sort of uh, superseding the Roman Empire. It didn't matter whether you were on the top of the totem pole or on the bottom, suffering, ill, or at war, the way God gave for his people to live together in community with the practices he gave them amounted to a better quality of life and people found that incredibly attractive. So image bearing is ambassadorial language, right? God has made men and women to be his image bearers. We are his ambassadors, his representatives in the world. What if in 2019, in a day and age when we're busy all the time, engaged all the time? What if God's people recovered a rhythm of real rest and Sabbath and lived this out as, held it out as a gift, an alternative way of doing life? So that's the first one that, um, the first reason that Sabbath is so good for us, it's fundamental to bearing the image of God. It's part of what it means, what, part of the way God is and one of the gifts he's given us. Here's the second one. It forms us in the gospel. It forms us in the gospel. Several of you know the uh, Enneagram. Uh, Richard Rohr is famous for saying that as a nation, if we as a nation were to take the Enneagram, we would be a three, which is uh, the achiever, Right? the achiever, the one who has to accomplish, has to achieve. And those of you who are are genuine threes will know that that works out so long as two things are happening, so long as you are achieving, and so long as the people around you are noticing and affirming your achieving. But if you stop achieving, or if the people who are meant to be noticing don't notice or don't value what you are producing, 
then being a three becomes, uh, in an unhealthy sense, it becomes much more of a struggle. And so uh, I think if Richard Rohr is right, that as a nation we are focused on productivity, on reclaiming every moment, on producing and performing and performing, then this gift of Sabbath tells us that in the first instance we are loved by God not for what we can produce but because he has made us and we are his. This is the way Marva Dawn puts it in her book, Keeping the Sabbath Holy. This is what we celebrate on the Sabbath day. We join the generations of believers going all the way back to God's people, the Jews, who set aside a day to remember that we are precious and honored in God's sight and loved, profoundly loved, not because of what we produce, but because we're his. I wonder if any of us need to hear that from God this morning. I know that as a pastor, one of the conversations that I have over and over and over again with people is people finding it hard to believe that God loves us, that he loves us unconditionally. And I wonder if we made space in our lives to receive this gift, this gospel gift that just says, enjoy me, not because you're being productive, not because you're getting it done, not because you're keeping the rules, but just grace. What if we made the space in our lives for that practice each week? I wonder if that would cultivate in our hearts greater facility for believing that God loves us and that he is gracious to us. It's interesting to me that when we see the Sabbath come up in the Gospels. It's so often because Jesus is healing people or serving people or meeting people on the Sabbath day and for his his, uh, enemies that he's, he's just breaking the rules and they want to trip him up as a result. But I wonder if this is God flagging for us again that here is a special day when God has made holy when he meets us, meets us in our need, shows up and serves us, even when we aren't necessarily bringing anything to the table that day. John Calvin, uh, who I don't quote too often, um, has four reasons that he came up with after uh, scanning the Bible fairly um, thoroughly for, for why we should practice the Sabbath. And one of them is this, it helps us to extend the gospel to others. And you heard this reflected a little bit in the language of the Exodus reading, right? Keep the Sabbath, why? Because remember you used to be enslaved and God rescued you. Do you hear it? It's grace. It is the archetype of God's salvation until you get to the cross is God rescues his people out of slavery. Keep the Sabbath, why? Because you will remember that God is gracious to you, that God rescues you. And so he goes on to say, and also anybody under your employee, you should make sure that they don't have to work on the Sabbath. So those of you who are employers, those of you who are influencers, those of you who shape the culture around you in your household, in your workplace, I wonder if embracing this gift of Sabbath would be one of the primary ways that you extend grace to those who are in and under your influence. Because when you're working, those around you feel like they need to be working. So two reasons uh, that the Sabbath is such a gift to us, two reasons we need it. Firstly, it's fundamental to, to bearing God's image, and secondly, it forms us in the gospel. It's a weekly remolding to remind ourselves that we don't earn God's love. He just gives it. Lastly, what could the Sabbath look like There are uh, any number of different uh, books out there, and I've alluded to a couple of them already this morning, that help give you ideas of what to do with your Sabbath. Um, 
And two of my favorite ways of framing it up uh, come from Marva Dawn and uh, Eugene Peterson, respectively. Marva Dawn talks about uh, the Sabbath as being a day for ceasing, for resting, for feasting, and for embracing. Ceasing, resting, feasting, embracing. Eugene Peterson, I think uh, even more succinctly, talks about the Sabbath as being a day for praying and playing. Some of you will have seen the movie The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, from the Chronicles of Narnia, and you might remember there's that scene after Aslan the lion, the rescuer, has been killed by the white witch on the stone table, and he's resurrected, and Lucy and Susan are there with them, with him, and do you remember what happens? The very first thing, he opens his eyes, he says, I feel my strength returning to me. Chase me. And they run off onto the hillside and they play this epic, epic game of tag. And at the end of it, they all flop down in the grass and it says, though they lay in the grass uh, exhausted after this game, it felt like they would never be tired or hungry or thirsty again. And then it has this incredible little line that says, Lucy wondered whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or with a kitten was playing with Aslan. This is uh, the way uh, Mark Buchanan uh, describes playing on the Sabbath. Play is subversive. It hints at a world beyond us. It carries a rumor of eternity, news from a kingdom where Kronos and utility are no more are no more welcome than death and Hades and the ancient serpent. When we play, we nudge the border of forever. This is also what happens when we keep Sabbath. Sabbath, Abraham Joshua Herschel says, is a foretaste and a heralding of eternity. Its joy is precisely this. It rehearses heaven. Peterson will, uh, will, will expound on this, and he'll say one of the points of Sabbath play is that you're wasting time. You're doing things that the rest of the week, you're like, there's no time for that. I gotta get stuff done. Time is utilitarian. Time is wasting. Time is money. And on the Sabbath, there's a levity and a bounty. And time can be spent because it's this sanctuary in time that pushes us towards eternity. So what does Sabbath look like? Praying and playing. Uh, Before I give you a a very brief outline of what it looks like for my family, I wanna give you a little chart um, because I think one of the ways we get confused uh, in our cultural moment is to conflate a Sabbath with a day off. And they're really quite different. Is that large enough for you to read? So um, here I'm contrasting a day off, a vacation, and a Sabbath, and they're not uh, the same things. Uh, obviously, the frequency, a day off, many of us have the American weekend. We've got two days uh, off a week. Uh, but the way we use those often is uh, for catching up, right? You work hard during the week, uh, which means that you're usually out of the house or doing productive stuff, remunerative stuff, and then you've got a weekend where you need to catch up on sleep, you need to catch up on your errands, you need to catch up on your fun. And so uh, you crush it on the weekends. Those of you who are parents uh, are probably um, at kids' engagements, going out, uh, and in 2019, all of us are still tethered to work uh, on our days off. Vacation, um, interestingly, Americans among uh, Western nations use the least paid vacation time of any Uh, nation in the Western uh, world. Um, And when we do, the way we tend to use our vacations, uh, at least the way I love to use vacations, is to go see new places, to go somewhere fun, a break from work uh, because it's a break from um, a change of scenery, and it's for cutting loose, right? You eat new things, you do new things, you uh, read new things, uh, and often it's about making memories. Sometimes, although, how many times have you heard somebody get back from their vacation and say, I need a vacation from my vacation? That's telling, right? Um, A Sabbath day is different from both of these. It's built into the warp and woof of our lives so that it crops up one day in every seven. And it's about, its primary purpose is receiving a gift. It's not about doing something 
but it's more about being. Um, it's it's uh, Pete Scazzaro who says, uh, he says that all of our doing is meant to flow out of our being. And if our being can't sustain our doing, then we're in big trouble. Sabbath is for connecting, but not just connecting with anyone. Um, how many of you know that there are those people who take energy from you and those, that are th- those people who give you energy, people who are restful to be around and people who are not restful to be around? And that's not a comment on how much you love them or, what, or whether they're good quality people or not. It's just people strike you in different ways. And so Sabbath, I think, often can be a day to connect with others uh, who help you to rest and be present to God and to his people, uh, to eat, to feast. Um, those of you who have been around Jewish friends or Jewish neighbors will know that the Sabbath is associated with the best meals of the week and other things that are life-giving. And at the end of a Sabbath day, hopefully you're feeling Grateful, grateful. We work six days toward a Sabbath, but for Christians, the Sabbath is the first day of the week, the day of resurrection, so we work out of our rest. Our rest fuels us and sustains us, and we achieve out of the grace uh, that has come first. So there's a little chart for you. Let me tell you briefly what um, Sabbath looks like in the McFadden family, and then we'll pray. Uh, often for us, on f- we, we Sabbath on Fridays, often what our Sabbath will look like is pancake breakfast. Um, we, Deck uh, helps me make a bunch of pancakes, uh, really big ones sometimes, and we use way too much syrup, uh, and that's a theme. Uh, eating tasty treats is a theme for our uh, Sabbaths. I think Jill and I realized, probably taking cues from some of you guys, that one of the basic ways to set up Uh, positive associations for things with your kids is do fun, tasty stuff. And we want our kids to grow up loving Sabbaths. So we uh, have a a big treat for breakfast. Uh, We try to spend time together outside. And we try to spend time together. This was one of our um, stated goals for our Sabbath uh, early on. And we knew that it was working when probably four months ago, Isla said to me, but if we do that, we won't be together. And I thought, interesting, she's catching on. Because the three biggest threats to our Sabbath are um, daddy working on his phone, even though uh, I'm not at work, uh, doing errands, because if you're not at work, it's tempting to, 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 to do the other things that you need to get done, or splitting up for the sake of efficiency rather than for the sake of proactive solitude. And so we've always, on our Sabbath days, got to resist those things. Uh, sometimes it, we feel like we've got to divide and conquer, but we try, even if it's inefficient, on our family Sabbaths uh, to stay together. We eat well. We do something outside if the weather's nice. We do something together, and we have uh, an evening meal that is um, usually, hopefully, requires less preparation. So we uh, eat out, we order in, we do leftovers, or we do something simple uh, fairly frequently. And we look for ways uh, often to spend time uh, with with friends, family, people we love, and have a slightly more spacious morning uh, of reading scriptures together uh, out loud. So those are some of our um, Sabbath practices. I realize that's that obtains to our life moment right now, where our kids are preschool age, come September, ooh, who knows what's gonna happen. Uh, so you've gotta, gotta make, adjust things for, for where you are in life, but I hope that some of these principles are helpful. Let me pray and then we'll transition uh, to the Lord's table. Father, you're so kind to us. Thank you for the gift of Sabbath. And I pray for this little church family. I pray that... Um, so far as you want to, that you would give this church family a new way of living into the Sabbath and of cultivating this gift and of experiencing your grace in it and of building one another up in it and of sharing this with our city. Because Father, we want more of you and we want to be more like you and we want to be better ambassadors for you. And if embracing this practice is one of the ways uh, you want to do that in us, we pray that you would uh, soften whether the theological stiff-arming or the busyness. 
or whatever other resistance we have for it. Father, help us to receive this gift from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.